Another solid week for precious metal performances in Fiat Federal Reserve note price terms. Especially with perhaps the two best bullion values at the moment, silver and platinum, performing very well to close the week. The silver spot price is around 1840 a troy ounce in Fiat US Federal Reserve notes. The gold spot price marked down a few bucks this week, closing at 1522 Fiat US dollars per troy ounce. The platinum spot price shot up nearly 100 bucks this week, closing at around $935 per troy ounce. And I've mentioned to you before, if you're regular listening to the show, platinum is about as cheap versus gold as it has been in about 100 years of time. Apparently, some momentum NYMEX derivative traders figured that out this week and moved the markets accordingly. Uh, the gold-silver ratio dropped like a rock this week. It now takes just over 82 ounces of silver to acquire one ounce of gold in spot price terms. This week, we will be speaking with returning guest Dave Kranzler about the crazy economic conditions of our times. And of course, we later in the conversation turn to both gold and silver markets to discuss much of what is happening, not only here with Western investor sentiment and fiat US dollar price action, but also what's going on in Asia. How are Indians and the Chinese reacting to all this bullion bullishness? Stay tuned. I'll be right back with Dave after this brief message from our show's sponsor. SD Bullion is a high volume, physical precious metals dealer here in the USA. If you are acquiring an investment grade bullion position, be sure to bookmark www.sdbullion.com forward slash deals, where each and every week we source some of the best bullion deals for our over 100,000 customers worldwide. At the bottom right section of our website, you can also easily subscribe to our weekly bullion deals mailing list, where you will receive weekly notifications of valuable product deals that may be exclusive only to our SD bullion mailing list. Stay tuned to sdbullion.com, the lowest price, period. Welcome to this week's Metals and Markets Wrap. I am your host, James Anderson of SD Bullion. With us this week, we have a returning guest, it's Mr. Dave Kranzler of Investment Research Dynamics. Hey, Dave, thank you so much for taking time coming back on our podcast. Hey, not a problem. I love doing the podcast with you. It's always entertaining <laughs> and hopefully informative. <laughs> yeah, hopefully for our guests. I mean, sometimes I get uh, very comfortable speaking with you and I forget the fact that we have guests even listening. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. so I, uh, to start out today, Dave, I mean, last time we spoke is a few months back. Uh, obviously, things have changed a little bit this summer. I think things have gotten a little bit more bullish in the precious metal sector for certain, and perhaps more volatile, too, in the other markets, uh, other financial markets. I wanted to give you a chance to give your update of your view of what's going on just in general, the macro, macroeconomic conditions in the financial industry. Sure. Well, it's, I mean, we're watching a, a repeat of 2007, 2008, only this time it's, it's five times as bad. Yeah. So, and I think that's, I think that's probably what's driving up the price of gold and silver for the most part. And it's, it's not just the United States, it's the entire globe, the entire the global financial system is a, is a catastrophe waiting to happen. We've almost been conditioned, right? I mean, if we talk about how the severity of this building up year, decade after decade, I mean, every crisis seems to get louder and larger and bigger, right? And so it's it's almost like we're just taking for granted the severity of so many things that are happening, right? I mean, it, it's just difficult to even put it into context. I mean, it, I think it's just part of the human condition because, uh, as you mentioned, you, you know, you see the same cycles repeating in in different forms over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And it's it's yeah. <laughs> at the root of it is fra a fractional banking system and and fiat money. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And this is the general symptoms of what comes from a breaking of a system that's coming apart that's really starting to fail and not work. You have a si situation where Literally, they turned the rules of, of interest rates on its head. Uh, the fact that you have $16 trillion in notional 
negative uh, interest-bearing government bonds, I believe. And there's other private corporate debt out there, too, that's negative interest rates, right? In Europe, I think the majority of corporate debt is even negative now. Is that what I, I read the other day, I think? It, it's sheer insanity to me. I, I'm not I'm not convinced that it's it's investors driving that. I think it's mainly the central banks over there buying the debt. Mm, yeah. Because yeah. you see the same thing in Japan. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The the Bank of Japan, I think, owns, I think I saw something like 80% of the equity ETFs right. now there or something. It's something crazy. Yeah. yeah, I think that I mean, is it's correct. Just, yeah. It's just sheer insanity. And it's, it's, um, it's humans who think they can control the laws of nature and the laws of economics, and they can't. Right. And they're going to keep trying to control it until it blows up. Yeah, I guess... You know, when, it, when we're talking about these arrogant uh, financial central bankers and, and people who want to control things and government, et cetera, um, you know, there's always the talk. Of, they, they know there are unknowns, but they also are they're unknown unknowns of some of the things that they're doing. They don't even it doesn't even reflect on some of them, like <laughs> the repercussions of some of the idiocy that's going on here. And, uh, you know, someone that I respect a lot is uh, William White. He, he worked for a long time at the BIS, uh, and, you know, in terms of research. And, and I've watched a couple of his interviews recently, and he's just one of the sharpest guys uh, who talks about central banking and who literally was a central banker for a long time. Um, and, and I was just watching his interview today, and that, that, that's why I brought up the unknown unknowns. Uh, you know, the, the disparity of wealth getting wider because of this uh, QE debauchment that's gone on in the past decade. I mean, and the political repercussions of that, what we see right now with Trump and the, the vote for, and it's basically an FU vote, uh, essentially, to send Trump into the office. Um, and, and I just saw a tweet today, like someone was talking about, uh, what was her name? Um, the Democrat, uh, that begins with a T, I'm forgetting her name, the tabby. Oh, Tulsi Gabbard, yeah. Tulsi Gabbard. They're, they're trying to keep her out of the debates. And some of the people on Twitter are saying, like, the fact that they want to keep her out of the debates is why they want her to win. I mean, she's basically the FU vote on the Democrat side right now, it seems. Uh, ironically, if you listen to all the candidate, the Democratic candidates, and I don't listen to them all, there's too many, mm -hmm. but she's the one that makes the most sense. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, she may she may not have an idea about financial. I, I think she understands like there's a lot of criminality financially, systematically, uh, a lot of injustice going on, wholesale injustice with the American people. Uh, although on a micro level, I don't think she talks enough detail, and I think that kind of underwhelms some people. But and when she talks about war and the the military budget and stuff like that, I mean that's why she's hated uh, essentially. Oh, absolutely. You know? I mean she's absolutely. basically talking about cutting back on that. And uh, that's a lot of money to a lot of people. And those people are nasty, by the way. If you cross them, they will, they will try and ruin your life with allegations. I mean, I've heard absolutely crazy stories from people that uh, I speak to in this industry that are former military of things that have happened in their lives. It's just absolutely wacko. Um, so if you're anti-war, sometimes the repercussions of those things will be uh, pretty ugly. Um, so... Anyway, so it was kind of a we kind of veered off on a tangent. I just wanted to you know kind of touch base in, in terms of just the general craziness of what we're seeing. Um, you know, this fall coming up, we're very close to September now, and this is generally where things start going haywire, right? Last year, in October, it started getting a little nutty, and it got bled into December, and we had the Mnuchin uh, Christmas Eve tequila stock rise, essentially, where he called the heads of the banks uh, and. and tweeted out to everybody, you know, no problem. I talked to everybody and the stock market will be fine. And, and the stock market came back to new nominal highs like four or five months later. Uh, it looked like Mnuchin and his team uh, of, uh, of stock pumpers, they did a good job. Uh, they pumped it, re they reflated the, uh, the bubble that was appeared to have been collapsing. So, Well, they had, they had help from Powell. Powell, how so? How do you think? Well, he's the one that came out and, and gave the speech that indicated that the, the Fed was going to probably loosen up monetary policy again. Yeah, basically a turn, to, turn face where they were talking about they were going to be raising interest rates to now we're cutting interest rates. to Now we have cut interest rates to now are they going to be cutting interest rates again? I, a lot of people talking, what, 50 basis points, potentially 100 basis points before the year's out. 
I, you know, I don't know. We'll wait. I just wait and see what happens. I, I, sure. I don't try to guess what the Fed's going to do anymore. I mean, <laughs> when he gave that speech, I think it was on actually the day after Christmas, he basically said that the the Fed was going to end quantitative tightening in October. Well, now they're ending it two months early, and in fact, it looks like they're starting they're starting to to uh, restart QE in a minor way at this mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it feels like obviously the rates are going to be cut more, uh, and the the calls for some type of weird QE will probably be coming into play. I imagine, as we discussed earlier on, how Europe seems to be buying up all this debt, uh, this negative interest rate debt, uh, going Japan. Uh, essentially, that's what a lot of people are arguing is that the U.S. is going to have to eventually do is go Japan as well by actually eventually buying uh, perhaps stocks or you know by by trying to regulate the, the 30 year or the longer rate. Uh, uh, I've seen, you know, hints of that even where, where it seems like they're going to be doing something uh, extraordinary in terms of uh, interest rate holding and pinning it down, essentially. It won't help, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> I mean, I think if Trump had his way, the Fed would be buying stocks every day. You know, I would. If he gets elected to a second term, who knows? Maybe he'll roll out a, an executive order authorizing or, or commanding the Fed to buy stocks. That's, that's well, it, <laughs> part of his the way he operates. Now, just to get really micro level on Trump, uh, it seems like he's using that Twitter box to help pump algorithms and get the stock market really going. I wonder if you've been noticing any trends in his Twitter box aside from Speaking out of both sides of his mouth, uh, what else have you seen in his Twitter box uh, that has made you, uh, um, you know, second guess or, or think about if there's a tactic to what he's doing? Oh, he's he he knows what he's doing. He's he he knows that the algos respond. You know, you know that these these algos, these hedge fund algos, they're they're programmed to read and react to words and headlines. Yeah. Right. I mean. Right. They, there's algos, hedge fund algos that that just scan Twitter all day long. I mean, it's, right. it's unbelievable. It's, right. it's it's really brave new world. So he knows all he has to do is is a, a short tweet about about you know something mildly optimistic about trade negotiations, and the market's going to take off. And I. I Honestly, I would not be surprised. I don't know that he necessarily trades it, but I wouldn't be surprised if he tells his his cronies and his buddies ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. That, that, well, I mean, isn't there executive privilege for a lot of congressmen and for insider training? You would imagine that the executive branch would certainly be above the laws of the regular uh, average citizens of the United States. I mean, that's, that's essentially uh, – I'm sure if you dig deep into the details – uh, that's probably the truth, and they're allowed to probably to trade on insider knowledge. Oh, the elitists have made it clear that they're above the law, and that's why <laughs> yeah. none of these guys go to jail. Of course, of course. I mean, 50 years ago, Hillary Clinton would have been in jail by now. Yeah, I mean, could you imagine if somebody even acted like she does 50 years ago? Uh, she would never have gotten the position she got in. I mean, no, at, at that at time, all. 50 years ago, people wouldn't act that uh, crude. Uh, right. They, they could never get away with it. Well, Trump um, wouldn't have been elected 50 years no, ago either. Yeah, of course not. This is what, <laughs> yeah, like... Yeah. Talk about a clown show. <laughs> I, I mean, it's just <laughs> embarrassing that he's our president. <laughs> well, I, I get... And know, I'm not a Democrat. I, I'm not a Republican no, either. No. I don't. I haven't voted since 92. I'm just too disgusted with the system in its yeah. totality. It's like voting doesn't matter. Right. That, I think my experience in 2008 with Ron Paul was enough to just understand, oh, okay, this is how the political system works? Wow. I mean, that was... Um, blew my mind and, and then you turn to the banking system you learn how that works it's uh, thank god for the internet because you finally get to learn the truth or the other side of the story um but uh yeah it broke broke my heart to kind of see that our politics are as, as lame as they truly are um, <laughs> it's just it's pretty pretty uh disheartening well it, the, the american public enables it because i think most people still still believe there's hope. And you know, when you tell people that you don't vote, oh, well, then you don't have a right to comment on any of this. Voting is a privilege. Right. You know, your vote does make a difference. Well, it doesn't make a difference. If I had voted for Obama based on hope and change, and he was going to clean up Wall Street and, and Capitol Hill, if I voted for him based on that, I would have been badly disappointed. Very angry. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, there was... 
he was awful. I mean, in terms of what he did. Well, if you look at his his campaign platform, and I almost did. I went to one of his speeches late in the campaign mm -hmm. in, in Denver. I wanted to see what it was all about in person, and it almost moved me to to vote because there's no way I wanted to see McCain in there either. <laughs> right. And uh, <laughs> right. And and then it, I started reading some things. About a week before, you know, I, I had to register and I, I was like, nope, not going to do it. Yeah. And I mean, if you go back and look at his platform, he he didn't fulfill any of his promises other uh -huh. than Obamacare. And if you consider Obamacare a promise fulfillment, then then you're just hopelessly naive. Right. It's not a lot of uh, real substance or action. It was more about like feeling good and, and pretty words. He he's was, a great speech yeah, maker. Yeah, man. for sure, for sure. He's yeah. clean. He's definitely clean, and he he makes you at least when you, when he was the president, you you could look at foreigners and be like, yeah, that's my president. He can speak very well. He's not crude. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas Trump is, uh, I mean, he's a different thing. It's he, a he's an orangutan. <laughs> All right, so let's swing this back. Let's get out of the political. I'm so sure we probably, uh, you know, pissed off a lot of listeners. <laughs> oh, I hate, I hate being in the let's... swamp. <laughs> I hate, I hate going to D.C. I hate that city. It just, it just, you just everywhere you walk, it's just all, all right. taxpayer largesse and special interests and and corruption. It just oozes. So let's swing it back. Let's swing it back toward the precious metals, the ones that reveal uh, some of the corruption. Uh, let's swing it back toward gold and silver. I, this this past this whole summer in general, you know, usually gold and silver is very quiet, and very dormant in the summer. That's been the absolute opposite here. This has been a hell of a summer for gold and silver, uh, especially gold. Uh, but silver of late has been showing extreme power. Uh, platinum as well, doing pretty well. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on what's going on. What, what, what is happening with the precious metals? Obviously, the turn with the Federal Reserve has is, is kind of bled into this, but there's other factors, I'm sure you, you think. Well, I've got to tell you, because um, I've been doing this sector, if you can do a sector, <laughs> since mid-2001. And I, I've never... I haven't seen the metals behave like this. It, it's like every time... It looks like the the banks are going to be able to to smash the price with paper. It bounces right back. I mean, it's it's like it's like one of those punching clowns. You know, right. you punch it, and it bounce. It snaps right back up. And it's it's um, you know, Bill Murphy at La Metropole Cafe in Gata. He he's he's got a term. It's uh commercial signal failure mm. and that's when that's when the physical demand just completely overwhelms the paper and it, it forces the shorts to scramble and cover their paper shorts mm. Mm. and it kind of feels like I, we saw that in in uh 2011 when silver ran like mm. from 25 to almost 50 very very quickly mm. i mean it, it it went parabolic at a point yep. And that would have been a commercial signal failure. You would have had, you know, a shortage of physical in relationship to the amount of, of paper shorts that were outstanding. And I think we're there again. I mean, the open interest in COMEX gold and silver has been persistently high for quite some time. And that in and of itself is is a indication of of the degree of effort that the banks are putting in to try and and um and control the price rise of gold and silver. Right. And I, I think what's happening is, well, first of all, you, obviously there's been a, a huge increase in central bank buying of, of gold. And, and it's not Western hemisphere central banks. It's, it's the Eastern hemisphere central banks. And several of them are not keeping their gold in London. They're opting to have it sent to their, to their sovereign their own sovereign custody and their own um, sovereign borders. Mm -hmm. I mean, Poland and Hungary are among the latest to have to, do, to have done that. Mm -hmm. And so, it it when you do that, when when you when you remove gold from the custodians in London, it removes um, part of the supply that they can use to to manipulate the market mm -hmm. and support the the derivative shorts mm -hmm. that are out there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big part of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And, you know, there's gold is gold forwards have been going into backwardation. Lease rates have been going into backwardation. And those are those are all um, indications of physical tightness. Yeah. So um, and and I think over and above just, you know, the, the central banks in East in the Eastern Hemisphere, I think over and above their accumulation of it, I it feels like there's the presence of a large buyer or buyers in London. And that's that's a big part of why the whenever there's a big paper attack on the price of gold and silver, why that why it snaps back very quickly. Mm -hmm. I think whoever the buyer or buyers are, whenever gold is getting smacked right now, it, it um, I think they come in and buy it. So they're not necessarily trying to drive the price higher. Mm -hmm. They're just saying, if you're going to sell us cheap gold and silver, we're going to take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost as if I'm um, looking at the chart. Um, you know, for August of this this year, right? I mean, I, we got over fifteen hundred dollars uh, an ounce fiat U.S. dollars uh, on August seventh, roughly, and it just looks like fifteen hundred's now like literally been support uh, for the last I don't know what is that three four weeks roughly three weeks it's been support. So perhaps that uh, perhaps there's somebody sitting at a bullion desk saying literally every time it gets near fifteen, I want physical and I want these lots. And uh, don't don't even blink. Just buy it, you know, in, in large volume. And so maybe that is exactly what's happening. I, it's just been so, so, so strong of late and there's been no give up and no let up. Like uh, uh, it's been we've been conditioned now for, you know, what, five, six years, Dave, uh, to, to just have our hopes dwindle and fade away with some derivative uh, beat down where the price just gets beat, you know, and bleeds straight downward. But here it's it's kind of doing the opposite slowly but surely. Um, you know, not, not hyperbolic, just, just very strong. Well, and again, I, I think it just speaks to the presence of a large accumulator or accumulate tours. And, you know, you should also add, we should add in the context of India that when the, the government raised the import duty on gold right. over there and it, it, it really, it, it, it put a break on the amount of gold that was being imported by the Indians. And so in their imports have really fallen off. Now it also means that the smuggling has also ramped up, of course. Yeah. but not the smuggling wouldn't replace no. what they we're importing. Right. So, and that's not, you know, and that's not only, I just looked at China the other day, as far as, you know, the, 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 the imports coming through Hong Kong and just their import data, not taking all the Shanghai stuff out of the equation. Cause that gets rather confusing. Uh, but their 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 importing is is down a lot uh, in the last few years, and they had quotas supposedly uh, trying to get people you know kind of stay in the wand because uh, people are afraid of uh, devaluation of the wand. So I think there was a, less gold being imported into China. So you have two key key drivers of physical gold not there that, as much as they were um, when the. Well, I, I'd be careful about making any assumptions about China yeah. there, okay? Because there's. Um, if you look at the, the the premium of of the price of gold that's being paid on the Shanghai Gold Exchange, mm -hmm. it's been again persistently for almost all summer, it's been twelve thirteen dollars above the world, the you know the spot price of gold, and that's an indication that that demand is higher than supply, and it's been suggested that the Chinese government has restricted the supply of gold into the Shanghai gold because all I don't know some some of the listeners may know this some may not but all of the gold that gets purchased in China has to go through the Shanghai Gold Exchange except the People's Bank of China mm -hmm. it's the only entity in China that does not have to source its gold from the Shanghai Gold Exchange mm -hmm. so I think there's a possibility that the People's Bank of China, the PBOC, is kind of quietly and way off the radar screen, just hoovering up as much gold as they can get. Mm -hmm. And you say, let's leave Shanghai out of the equation. Well, you can't do that because in, in 2014, the Chinese government opened up Beijing and Shanghai to gold imports. And those, and they specifically were not going to publish the numbers 
the, the, you know, the amount of gold going in through those two ports mm -hmm. because they wanted to, you know, leave that again off the radar screen. So you can't, you really can't measure what's, what, how much gold is flowing into China mm -hmm. by looking just at Hong Kong or even necessarily the Shanghai Gold Exchange mm -hmm. because there, there's a whole other element there, the PBOC. Sure. Sure. That could be, and I don't know. They may be the buyer out there. I don't know, or buyers. Yeah. I mean, it's to so. it's totally po po possible, right? I mean, if you're, let's think about this in terms of real real politique, right? I mean, President Xi went over to Trump, Mar Mar a Lago, like a couple of years ago. They had a meeting, and maybe they're playing war games, you know, and basically have a real, a true, actual agreement that's going on underneath. And it's it's probably a lot to do with. Hey, we need to have a hedge to these dollars that we've accumulated the last two decades, and uh, we don't feel comfortable. So you need to let us acquire for a decade plus a shit ton of gold. Uh, sorry to use that word, but I mean that's basically what they looks like that we've been doing. We've been allowing them to hoover up Western physical gold flowing out of London, uh, and that's been happening for over a decade, ever since the financial crisis. Uh, in 2015, there was a seminal interview. Uh, I would suggest you go to SD Bullion Gold Prices 2015. Google search that. There's a uh, podcast with a head of a Swiss refinery talking about uh, the gold price. And this is in late 2015 when the gold price was near 1050. OK, uh, so so go ahead and listen to that full interview because it's shocking the kind of stuff the guy says. I mean, it's amazing. They're working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, literally just to, to meet the gold demand coming out of China mainly. Yeah, I remember that interview. And the guy literally said, like, the price, the spot price you see has absolutely nothing to do with what's going on underneath. I mean, it's absolutely ludicrous. There's a huge disconnect. And so, uh, yeah, that interview to me was just sometimes you feel crazy, like working in this industry. You know, you, you literally are like, why does this spot price? This makes no sense. Uh, but then you get somebody to confirm you're not crazy. And it just it, you never forget it. It's like, OK, sometimes when I need to feel like I'm not absolutely crazy, I need to go back and listen to that interview because there's a guy who works in one of the four major gold suppliers in the world, and he was talking literally like he was on King World News uh, or Silver Doctors. You know, we were just talking about the gold price going to the moon, right? I mean, it's like it was um, to me. It, it bolstered my confidence in that I was on the right track, essentially, when I heard it. So, um, anyway, I always bring it up when I when I ever when I, whenever I talk about China and gold. When that's to me was one of the. One of the aha moments when I heard that interview. Yeah, there's no question about it. I mean, you know, GAD has compiled all the evidence that you need to see. And I, it's like I, when people want to ask, ask me what's going on and how do I know, I would say, look, just go to the GATA website and go to their archive and start reading the articles from or starting around the year 2000. And you don't have to read them all. You'll know from the titles which ones to read. I've had a couple interviews with Chris Powell. That guy is sharp as a tack, and he pulls so up all bright. all the major tenant, you know, all the major tent poles of where, like, here's, you know, just it's just like hardcore evidence you bring into a court of law, <laughs> and he's just rattling them off his head, and it's uh, it's just amazing how good he is in those in long form interviews. You give him thirty or forty minutes of space, and he will just uh, he'll put out a convincing argument of of what's been going on and. Uh, and not necessarily like he's not like gold bull. Like he's simply just saying, look, we should have free and fair markets. <laughs> and we oh, don't. right. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, commendable. Uh, Chris Powell and the team over at GATA, what they've been doing. Um, so maybe if I could swing it back toward uh, one of your latest posts. Uh, I saw you, you tweeted it out yesterday and it's kind of what drove me to call you. I wanted to talk to you about your um, post where you talked about uh, don't let the CPM group feed you a bag of brown stuff about silver. Uh, and that's on investmentresearchdynamics.com. Um, you know, I've had CPM Group's head, the proprietor, Jeffrey Christian, on this podcast a couple of times. Some of the listeners uh, don't like Jeffrey Christian because they think he's, a, you know, essentially a, a apologist for the criminal banking syndicate, essentially. Oh, he is. <laughs> uh, that's what a lot. Yeah, OK. So I, I get it. I understand the anger. Um, uh, but sometimes I like to have him on because he gives good opposing arguments. It's good sometimes to, you know, to hear them and to, you know, sometimes I don't challenge him back because I don't want to be confrontational sometimes in interviews. So there'll be things he says where I just like that was bullshit, but I won't say it on the interview um, because I just don't want I don't want to get in a situation where the guy won't come on because I want to have him be able to come on the interviews. I, I find it interesting. 
And to be honest, I mean, he's he was dead right, like in a couple interviews in 2011, where he basically called the you know the silver spike. The silver spike was probably something that you should sell into. <laughs> Gold spikes probably something you should sell into in 2011, and he was he was proven correct. So sometimes uh, broken clocks can be right, uh, and and essentially you know that's probably true with us as well. <laughs> um, but anyways, I, to, to digress, I want to bring it back to this latest publication that they did on silver. Uh, I read through it, and I'll put it in the show note links if people want to read through it. But could you go over kind of why it made no sense at all? Well, his whole premise is that the it says in right in the second paragraph, investment demand has been very low during this time. So he's talking about from when silver rose from 1641 to where it is now. Um, you know, from the end of July till now, and. I don't understand where he's getting his facts and figures from on, in, you know, investment demand. He actually he bases it on on the sale of of one ounce silver eagles from the mint. And to me, it's 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 idiotic to think that the U.S. retail investor demand for silver eagles drives the price of silver. Or, or I mean, silver eagle sales in any given year are at most five percent of global production in a year. That's that's not enough to push around the price of silver up or down. So, I mean, just just to, I mean, if you just look at the cash flows into SLV and some of the other. Some of the other uh, ETFs. I mean, th th those flows alone have been enormous, and that doesn't necessarily mean. I'm not saying that I believe that that cash turns into actual silver bars that are kept in the vault. I, I think those. I think those ETFs were designed as a as a cash trap for institutional investors who wanted to invest in gold, and that made it easy for them to at least index the price of gold because that's all they do. But. Um, I mean, first of all, 70, 75 percent of all silver consumption in any given year goes to industrial uses and, and jewelry and silverware manufacturers. And, and yeah. he doesn't talk about that at all. It's only very rare. I think 2015, maybe a quarter of all silver went to actual investment demand. And that was I mean, that was driven because uh, in 2015, you recall silver had finally looked like it bottomed out in price and people were buying it hand over fist, uh, the physical um, interest in buying bullion, and not only here in the United States, but also in India was massive. Uh, India, there, there was other places in too, but if you look back at the data, literally a quarter of all the physical uh, silver bullion supply was for investment demand. And, and that's probably back in the teens now. Um, but I think what Jeffrey Christian would argue is that it's at the margin, maybe sometimes when there's a lot of physical demand that that things can, you know, it can it can definitely move the price one way or another. But I think you're more correct in terms of when you look back at 2010 from a price of twenty five or twenty dollars silver running up to 50. That was short covering. I mean, that, or, or, you know, Ted Butler would argue it was ETF demand too. the ETF point that you just made. I mean, it. I've looked at the ETF data. There's there's over 100 million ounces supposedly of physical silver that's flowed into them in the last few months. And I think a couple of weeks ago I mentioned that to Jeffrey Christian that we have, you know, 60 million odd ounces running into SLV, and he was acting as if he was surprised and you know that he thought silver market was tighter than that and all that kind of stuff. And it was like, oh, okay, well, where the hell did they get 60 million ounces of silver? And yeah, I guess he he basically said market makers have it sitting on a shelf ready to go, and you know, <laughs> so it's like, they're just they're just hedging it, you know, in the in the overdeveloped comics market where the derivatives really set the price, not the physical. So I mean, it was uh, we've kind of talked ourselves into a nonsense world. So I mean, uh, I, I read the CPM report, and you were you were correct to, to criticize it. I, I thought the fact that he dragged out a million, I think it was a million ounces of silver eagles that sold this past month, and we're talking about 2019 silver eagles. And that's as evidence that investment demand is low. <laughs> Which is rid ridiculous because, uh, you know, I was looking at our data just internally at SD Bullion the other day, and the amount of uh, secondary Silver Eagles is just huge. Uh, it, it's much larger than the new Silver Eagles that are being sold. So uh, that data is just ridiculous. New, new U.S. Mint data is is literally like uh, it's like one hair on a cat's back. It's very tiny, right. you know. <laughs> so Exactly. <laughs> 
Um, so hey, yeah, here's another here's another factor that I'm sure is coming into play for silver consumption. I mean, you mentioned what happened with India back in 2015, and if you recall, the government um, was trying to put a break on gold mm -hmm. importation back then. Mm -hmm. I, f I forget exactly what what um, law was passed or what regulation was put in place, but um, it was eventually lifted. But it it it, it definitely put a break on on um, gold consumption, and so they they shifted to buying silver. Yeah, it, it's That's also. And I, I have a feeling that's what's going on right now. I haven't I haven't looked for the data, but I mean the Indians, the Indian public is is going to is going to convert their their cash, their rupees into gold or silver, and their preference is gold. But they'll also buy silver if 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 gold is impractical or too expensive. So um, I I'm sure that. Once the imp once the import duty was raised, I'm sure a lot of the the Indian public started buying silver. And now you've got you're going into the largest buying right. season for the Indians for gold. And there's the monsoon season over there has has been good, which means that the farmers are going to have a lot of money that they'll immediately convert into either gold or silver. Mm -hmm. So that's going to put even more pressure on on the physical market uh, over the next three or four months. Now, I, I do pay attention a lot to India because I don't think people realize it is really the silver gorilla in terms of the amount of physical demands, especially when these duties that you're talking about are put on gold or when the price of gold in rupees is at all time nominal price highs like it is currently. Uh, people then look at silver and they're like, well, uh, we're about halfway off of the all time rupee high price for silver. I think I'll take silver. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you exactly. know, and, and that's that's why they take and when they when these these demand spikes happen in India, they literally take one out of four ounces of physical silver that is either recycled or newly mined in the world. I mean, that is just nuts. Uh, but they are, you know, the silver gorilla. Uh, they make J.P. Morgan's comics inventory look like a joke. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like I mean, India, when it wants silver, it, it does. It doubles what it took J.P. Morgan over a decade to get almost. You know, it's it's pretty amazing. So, right. And, you know, China, we don't know what what they're doing in terms of um, silver importation because that, that data doesn't get published. So and and I know at least a couple of years ago, I mean, they've got a massive solar energy program in place. And now and this was actual data that I saw a couple of years ago that basically the amount of silver that they were using for their solar program was equal to the amount of silver that's mined in China. So that means that any other silver that's consumed by the Chinese had to have been imported. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, again, who knows if, if the Chinese government's doing something that restricts the flow of gold in the Shanghai Gold Exchange, which therefore that's why we see such a high premium uh, being paid for gold versus spot, then I would assume that I think it's not a bad assumption that uh, by investor demand in China has somewhat shifted to silver as well. Well, that's interesting. The um, and again, those are you can't quantify those, so I didn't even want to put that into my write up. But yeah, those are definitely factors. Sure. I think that are that are pushing the price higher right now. It certainly you certainly is is. Uh, a fraud to say that investment demand is low, mm. like he does right at the start of his report. Yeah, I think uh, that would be incorrect because I know personally our sales right now are, are very high. The volume that's coming out and the amount of, that we're shipping day to day. It's uh, here's the thing. I've been in this industry, I think, since 2008 or so, uh, you know, before the financial crisis. Right. I was investing in the industry for a couple of years before and, you know, spending so much time, I figured I may as well start working in it. And so <laughs> <laughs> I uh, started working in the industry. And what I notice in this industry a lot is um, people, especially first time buyers, they love to buy in a rising market because it confirms they're not crazy. Um, that's like a psychological thing they, 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 they actually don't mind buying and see the price rise because, you know, when it comes to me, it's going to be worth more. That's, that's how, and how they rationalize it in their head. Um, you know, and most of the time they're buying in multiple steps. It's not just one time buys, right? They're, they're buying in dollar cost averaging. Um, it's only the shrewd, uh, multi-year veterans who, uh, come buying heavy when the price falls or crashes, right? Because they know, 
that's a that's a that's a gift. That's an opportunity to get a discount, and that that's when they come in and buy. So you see heavy uh, volumes being bought when prices spot prices fall. You see little nibs, uh, little little bites coming when the price is rising slowly, like it is now. So uh, it's interesting in terms of the uh, psychology and the volume of buyers. But the idea that there's not much silver uh, interest right now is is asinine. That's not even close to true. Uh, I was looking at Google Trends today trying to kind of come up with the sentiment gauge as to what, what in the past is similar to this, what, what time. And I don't know if you're aware about what Google Trends, you can basically see how many people in the United States are searching, or in the world for that matter, certain, certain terms. And so I did a tweet, I think, about it, talking about gold price and silver price. And, um, you know, those terms are very important. If someone wants to see the silver price and they don't have an app that they use on their smartphone, they just Google smart, you know, they just Google silver price and they'll, They'll find it pretty quick, the silver spot price. And so if you look at all that data from 2004 to today, I was looking back at it, and it feels like this is kind of like 2006-ish, uh, you know, when, when uh, Warren Buffett was selling off his massive hoard of silver into SLV, roughly. Uh, you know, when you're looking at the volume, the difference now, though, is, uh, A, there's a lot more people who are shrewd about gold and silver, uh, thanks to the Internet, uh, and, and just how many people have learned about it, and then how many people are now have you know ounces in the game that are actually invested in it and so it's just a huge more larger amount of people individually who are interested in this sector so uh, but sentiment wise it feels kind of 2006 just uh, after reflecting on it but i wasn't even in the industry in 2006 i was i was i was investing on the side kind of looking at it and making stupid mistakes like buying gld and um (laughs) you know buying from dealers that were no good or calling dealers that were no good who were trying to put me in leverage accounts and things like that so uh, a lot of learning the hard way i guess dave is uh is kind of how i got to where i got but um Anyways, I thought people might find that somewhat interesting because it's a reflection of over 10 years of being in this business. And it's uh, it's trying to gauge Well, the sentiment is obviously bullish and for a very good reason right now. We we had a big move in, in the sector from like the end of 2005 until May 2006. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And I, I was trading silver futures pretty much not quite around the clock, but I was – I was like actively trading silver futures back then. So, um, yeah, you're you're right. It is. I mean, without seeing the Google Trends data yet, um, you're right. It is. It, it is kind of similar to then. So the one nice thing about this interview, Dave, is that since we didn't use uh, video, I'll be putting up a lot of charts and different uh, you know graphics. So currently, you know, I'll make sure when I edit this uh, this interview that I, I put that Google Trends up there so people can kind of see what I'm talking about. But uh, You'll you'll see it if you watch the interview later on, Dave. But uh, oh, I'll me, watch yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. Those those trends are interesting, and it it's just kind of it's like one of those tools that you can use to gauge sentiment. And um, you know, Google Trends for Dow is one of the more interesting Google Trends to look at right now because that's like the lazy man search for what's going on in the stock market. <laughs> and it is it is as volatile as Trump's tweets. Let me tell you, it is. And these are human beings. These are not algos pumping Dow into the search. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> so this is uh, it's a really powerful tool, uh, and I, I definitely uh, suggest that people use it for whatever they're interested in. You can learn a lot using Google Trends. So. So, Dave, I wanted to give you a chance to speak to the listeners, let them know what you do uh, for your for your followers, what uh, types of products you offer over at investmentresearchdynamics.com. Sure. So I have the Short Sellers Journal, which is kind of self-explanatory, and it's a weekly newsletter, and I, I kind of start at the macro level, and I dissect the important economic data and try to de-spin it after it's been spun by the media. And then I, then I present um, ideas for making money shorting stocks and using puts and calls to do that. Mm-hmm. And that gets published every Sunday night. And then um, I also do the Mining Stock Journal. When, and each issue takes more work. They're, they, they're both the same price. Or if you subscribe to both, you get the second one for 50% off. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that one I publish twice a month. Wow. on Thursday evenings. And it's kind of a similar format. I, I talk briefly about what's going on, what I see and what I think is going on in the precious metal sector. And then I then I update as thoroughly as possible the, the companies that I've kind of presented in the past and cover actively. 
Um, and then I try to come up with a new idea. You know, it's hard to come up with a new idea every other week. That's that's a good idea. So that's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. That. <laughs> so, um, but you know, there's I usually kind of come up with some sort of idea, whether it's buying in the money calls on mm-hmm. Mag Silver or something like that. Yeah. Which, right. um, which we did in my fund a couple weeks ago in the money calls on Mag Silver and on SSR Mining, and we've done really well on them so far. And no plans on selling those. It, it, you know, use the in the money calls because you can basically replicate being long the stock for half the capital. Mm-hmm. And you're limiting your risks, right? I mean, I, right, the, the downside, correct? Yes. You're well, mm-hmm. I mean, it, 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 a deep in the money call that, that doesn't expire too far out will basically trade in lockstep with the stock. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it just lets you control. Um, you know, 100 shares per contract without putting up the same amount, you know, with putting up maybe half the capital yeah. to do it. Okay. So you get a little leverage too. Nice. Yeah. Well, cool. I'm going to have to make you after this interview, send me a couple of your latest reports so I can see it. Because sometimes, I, you know, when I interview people, it helps for me to get a view of their product. So I'm going to, I'm going to strong arm you to send me. You should have said something when we <laughs> set this up. I would have sent you a couple. <laughs> It's all good. It's all good. But I definitely suggest, it, you know, people out there, I'll leave in the show notes backlink to investmentresearchdynamics.com. Uh, check out the CPM report that uh, Dave shreds. And uh, Dave, thanks so much for coming on. It's always a pleasure. I always enjoy having you on the podcast. And I hope the listeners, I, I'm pretty confident they feel the same way. Um, and uh, thanks again for coming on. Likewise. Well, thanks for having me. And, and I always enjoy it. And I look forward to coming on again in the future.